a nation turning further and further away from God. Leaders who were ungodly and who not only tolerated sinful behavior, but even encouraged it and promoted it. A culture that was becoming more hostile toward the followers of God, marginalizing them and even persecuting them. And then the nation facing natural disasters and economic hard times due to God withdrawing his favor from them. No, I'm not talking about the United States today, although there are some uncomfortable parallels between the two, aren't there? But I'm referring to the nation of Israel during the days of the prophet Elijah, particularly during Ahab's reign as Israel's king. Remember Ahab and his queen Jezebel, they were just plain evil. They were promoting idolatry, the worship of a false god called Baal, and they had actually put to death a number of God's prophets. Well, Elijah had announced a famine in the land because of their ungodliness, and they had suffered the consequences of it for several years. In the scripture that we're looking at today, in 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah, after having hidden out for a while, he shows back up to confront the king and his false prophets. Now, we're not going to get into that dramatic encounter in any great detail, but you may remember how Elijah had the prophets of Baal to get together and they had a showdown of sorts to show who was really God, Baal or Jehovah. Jehovah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And through sending fire down from heaven to consume the sacrifice, God showed himself to be the one and only true God, while Baal's prophets failed to get any response out of their so-called God. But before Elijah confronted those prophets, he confronted the people of Israel themselves who had gathered to witness this event. Now you could put some blame on the leaders, but it was the people who chose to follow those ungodly leaders. So ultimately, the responsibility fell back on them. And maybe that's something that we need to remember in our day too. We can blame our leaders for certain things, but we're getting the leaders we've elected as a nation. God's giving a vast number of people in our country what they say they want, and we're suffering the consequences. Now, we can point our finger of blame at the leaders, but it mainly falls back on the people of our nation. And some of the blame also falls back on the church and on those who profess to be followers of God today because we haven't been all that God calls us to be. So Elijah confronted the people. And that's what I believe the Lord wants us to focus on this morning. In verse 21 of this chapter, it says this, And Elijah came to all the people and said, how long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him, not a word. Elijah was telling the people more or less that it's time to take a stand. They've been faltering between two opinions or options. They've been wavering back and forth. They'd been trying to, to have it both ways, we might say, or trying to sit on the fence. The word falter means to move uncertainly or unsteadily. Many in Israel, and probably Israel as a nation, still profess to be the people of Jehovah, the people of the God who had brought them out of Egypt and parted the waters of the Red Sea, the God who had given them the Ten Commandments and who had brought them into the Promised Land and made them a nation. But in reality... In practice, many of them were more aligned with this idol Baal. And Elijah was calling them to make a choice, to take a stand, to either choose God or choose Baal, either follow one or follow the other. And I believe that's God's call to us too. Many in our nation would call themselves Christian, but are they really following Jesus? As a nation, you know, we still have as our motto, in God we trust. But is it God that we're really trusting? Many people claim to worship the Lord, but they have idols in their lives to whom they give greater attention and devotion than to God. The Lord is confronting us this morning, us as a nation, 
us as professing Christians and us who are gathered here in this place this morning, proclaiming, how long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. It's time to quit sitting on the fence. It's time to take a stand. It's time to go all in for God or for Jesus. Now, we can look at various specific issues that we're facing today in light of this command to take a stand. But instead, we're going to look at several more general principles because it's our commitment to these principles that affects how we deal with many of the more specific issues that come our way. If we've settled those matters, those, those general principles, then the other things tend to fall into their proper place. So first of all, I believe the Lord is asking us today, how long are you going to falter between two opinions? Do you believe the Bible and accept its divine authority or not? So much depends on how we view the Bible, doesn't it? Because so many of our other beliefs stem from what the Bible says and how we regard what it says about those matters. Is it really God's word that says these things? Or is it just another fallible book written by man? Many today are faltering between their opinions or views concerning the scriptures. Some people give it some measure of divine inspiration or even authority, but they see a lot of man's ideas mixed in with it. They want to rely on parts of it while at the same time denying other parts. Now, we'll accept the Ten Commandments or the words in red, the words Jesus spoke or whatever other part we may point out, but, but we give less credibility to the rest of it. Some aren't very confident that Scripture can be relied on as a valid source of truth. So many end up picking what parts they want to believe and what parts they don't depending on their own ideas, or maybe depending on what fits with the accepted norms of our modern culture. How long? How long are we going to falter between two opinions? Is the Bible God's word or not? If it is, then believe it. Live by it. Study it so you know what it says. And obey it. Follow what it says. Even if it contradicts what you want, or if it goes against what's what, what's popular thinking in our day, if it's God's word, accept it and take a stand for it. Even if others around you aren't going to agree with you, and even if they lash out at you or cancel you or persecute you, it's time to take a stand for the truth of God's word and not just parts of it. If the Bible is God's word, then, then we should believe its own testimony about itself. Now, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says that all Scripture, all, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So not just Jesus' words, not just those exhortations about love, but also the warnings about sin and judgment and other things. It's all divinely inspired, not just parts of it. Peter adds about Scripture that it came about, he says, as holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. As they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Jesus, he declared that not one jot or tittle, which was referring to the smallest little marks in their alphabet, not one tiny speck would pass from the law. He went on to say that whoever breaks one of the least of the commands and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches those commands shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. All God's word is true and it's all valid and it all carries the authority and the weight of God. So I believe the Lord is calling us to take a stand for his word to quit ignoring parts of it, to quit downplaying certain commands that maybe we don't like, but to accept the entirety of Scripture as the inspired, authoritative Word of God and start treating it as such and start obeying it as such. 
the way our society is going, and the way many professing Christians are going, you're going to have to decide where you stand on the authority of the Bible. When it says something is sin, do you believe it or not? When it declares certain truths about gender and marriage and God's intention from creation about our family relationships, or when it indicates the value of the life of a baby in a mother's womb, when it addresses other issues that we're dealing with today, do we take that to be the word of God to believe and act on, or do we not? It's time to stand for God's word. A second area I believe the Lord would speak to us about today is this. How long will you falter between two opinions? Do you love the Lord with all your heart or do you love other things more than him? Specifically, do we love him more than we love this world and some of the things of this world? In Elijah's day, Israel had their idol, Baal, that was garnering their devotion. In some cases, you know, some of those people may have just been going along with the king and, or with what was popular at the time. In other cases, some of them may have developed a strong attraction for and devotion to this false god and its worship. But Elijah confronted them and said, you need to make a choice, either God or Baal. Many professing Christians in our day try to have it both ways. To follow God and to still have some idols in the world that we cling to at the same time. Oh, that you know, they're usually not images that we bow before and worship. But they're things in this world that have a lot of our devotion. Even to the point that they sometimes rival our devotion to God. They compete with our time and energy in serving the Lord. Those things have come to have such a hold on us that they sometimes hinder us from drawing as close to the Lord as we should be doing. Yet the Bible warns us about how the things of this world and our love for them can hinder our relationship with the Lord. John exhorted us very strongly. He said, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, this isn't just talking about the physical world in general. There are things in this world we can enjoy. I think it's okay for me to love my wife's lasagna that we're going to be eating today at our potluck dinner, as long as I don't eat too much of it. And we can love our families. We can love certain aspects of this world to an extent. You know, this is talking primarily about the ungodly things in this world or the things of this life apart from Christ and putting the physical and our possessions and the things of this life ahead of God. As it goes on to spell out for us here, it says all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And then it reminds us, it says, the world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. We need to avoid the evil things of the world, but it goes beyond that. We need to be more devoted to the things that will last and that will matter for eternity, not just these temporary things that will soon pass away and be gone. Paul told Timothy that a good soldier of Christ doesn't entangle himself with the affairs of this life. He doesn't entangle himself with the affairs of this life. This may be the greater danger for some of us, that we enjoy some of the good things in life, but we let them start getting hold of us. And before we know it, we're entangled in them. We find it hard to pull free from them. Our devotion to those things starts getting in the way of our devotion to the Lord. E. Stanley Jones tells about a friend of his who was in a train wreck. There are a number of fatalities because of that wreck and many others who were injured. Well, in the aftermath of that wreck, as people were trying to rescue the trapped and assist those who were injured, there was a lady sitting next to her open suitcase complaining over the loss of her expensive shoes. The wrong things had her devotion and focus in that situation. And I'm afraid the same thing can be said for a lot of people today. 
Some of us need to free ourselves from some things in this world that we've gotten tangled up in. And we need to love God more. Love Him first. Be more concerned about the people around us who are facing spiritual death and free ourselves from bondage to those lesser things. We may need to totally separate ourselves from some of those things, or we may need to simply relegate them to a lower place in our lives. But we need to affirm that the Lord is our first love, and He has priority over everything else in our lives. Our work, our hobby, our sports team, our family, whatever it may be. We need to quit faltering between two opinions and love the Lord more than anything else in our lives. Well, finally this morning, I believe the Lord would ask us, how long are you going to falter between two opinions? If Jesus is Lord, then put your trust in him and submit to his lordship over your life. There are some who want to be considered Christian, but who haven't ever taken that step of trusting Jesus to be their savior. Maybe they've attended church, they prayed, they read their Bible some, but never trusted what Jesus did on the cross as the sacrifice for their sins to forgive them and to cleanse them. They've never experienced that change of heart from trusting Jesus to save them from their sins. Some need to quit sitting on the fence and take that step of faith. Others maybe have invited Jesus into their hearts at some point, but aren't really letting him rule over their lives. They want Jesus to be part of their lives, but not the boss. I guess that's another way we could put it here. You know, how long will you falter between two opinions? If Jesus is Lord and boss, then submit to him as such. But too many of us want to hold that position of boss in our lives, ourselves. We want to keep calling the shots. We want to maintain veto power over anything. We want to sit in the driver's seat and maybe let Jesus just be a navigator whose guidance we can choose to follow or choose not to follow. Well, some of us need to get out of the driver's seat and let Jesus take over. And we know it. We, we know there are areas we're holding back from his lordship. But we keep trying to have it both ways. To have Jesus and to still have control ourselves. It's time for some of us to go all in for Jesus. To quit holding back and trust him and surrender ourselves and our lives completely to him. How long will you falter between two opinions? If Jesus truly is Lord then let him be Lord of your life. You'll notice in the scripture that we read that when Elijah confronted and challenged the people with those words, how the people responded. It says, they answered him, not a word. They answered him, not a word. Now, after the fire fell from heaven and consumed the sacrifice, then the people fell on their faces and they proclaimed, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. But until that happened, just crickets, as we sometimes say today. Just silence. What is it going to take for us to get to that point? What is it going to take for us to take a stand? To take a stand for God's Word? To love the Lord more than we love the things of this world? and to truly put our trust in Him as our Savior and submit to Him as the Lord who rules over our lives. Will we respond to this challenge with silence again today? Are we waiting for some spectacular sign like fire to fall from heaven? I don't know that God will do that. But He may speak to your heart and convict you of your sin. He may use some things in your life, including allowing some hardships in order to try to get your attention. He may allow pandemics and tough economic times and wildfires and hurricanes and other things to try to get the attention of our nation and to get us to turn back to him. I believe God is confronting us and he's saying it's time to take a stand for him. Will you do that today? Maybe it starts with trusting him to be your savior. Are surrendering control of your life over to Him. 
I invite you and encourage you to do that today.